Unshrinking went Aeneas, step for step with his guide. Dimly through the shadows and dark solitudes they wended, just as, through fitful moonbeams, under the moon's thin light, a path lies in a forest. When Jove has palled the sky with gloom, and the night's blackness has bled the world of colour. From here is the road that leads to the dismal waters of Arcaro. A dreadful ferryman looks after the river crossing. Caron, appallingly filthy he is, with a bush of unkempt white beard upon his chin, with eyes like jets of fire. He poles the boat, he looks after the sails, he is all the crew of that rust-coloured wherry which takes the dead across. The priestess of Apollo salutes him shortly, thus. Trojan, Aeneas, renowned for war and a duteous heart, comes down to meet his father in the shades of the underworld. No more is said. Charon is struck with awe by her gaze. He turns his sombre boat and poles it towards the bank. Then, clearing the gangways to make room for the big frame of Aeneas, he takes him on board. The ramshackle craft creaked under his weight and let in through its seams great swashes of muddy water. At last, getting the Sibyl and the hero safely across, he landed them amidst wan reeds on a dreary mudflat. Huge Cerberus, monstrously crouched in a cave confronting them, made the whole region echo with his three-throated barking. The Sibyl, seeing the snakes bristling upon his neck now, threw him for bait a cake of honey and wheat, infused with sedative drugs. The creature, crazy with hunger, opened its three mouths, gobbled the bait. Then its huge body relaxed and lay sprawled out on the ground, the whole length of its cave kennel. Aeneas, passing its entrance, the watchdog, neutralized, strode rapidly from the bank of that river of no return. At once were voices heard, a sound of mewling and wailing, ghosts of infants sobbing there at the threshold, infants from whom a dark day stole their share of delicious life snatched them away from the breast, gave them sour death to drink. Next to them are located the sorrowful ones who killed themselves, throwing their lives away, not driven by guilt, but because they loathed living. How they would like to be in the world about now, enduring poverty and hard trials. God's law forbids. That unlovely fen, with its glooming water, corrals them there. The nine rings of sticks corral them in. Not far from here can be seen, extending in all directions, the veil of mourning. Such is the name it bears. A region where those consumed by the wasting torments of merciless love haunt the sequestered alleys and myrtle groves that give them cover. Death itself cannot cure them of love's disease. Amongst them, with her death wound still bleeding, through the deep wood were straying Venetian Dido. Now when the Trojan leader found himself near her and knew that the form he glimpsed through the shadows was hers, as early in the month one sees, or imagines he sees, through a rack of cloud the new moon rising and glimmering, he shed tears and addressed her in tender, loving tones. Poor, unhappy Dido. So the message was true that came to me saying you'd put an end to your life. Oh, God. Was it death I brought you then? I swear by the stars, by the powers above, by whatever is sacred in the underworld, it was not of my own will, Dido, I left your land. Don't move away. Oh, let me see you a little longer. To fly from me when this is the last word fate allows us. Thus did Aeneas speak, trying to soften the wild-eyed, passionate-hearted ghost, and brought the tears to his own eyes. She would not turn to him, 
she kept her gaze on the ground, and her countenance remained as stubborn to his appeal as if it were carved from recalcitrant flint or a crag of marble. At last she flung away, hating him still, and vanished. Nonetheless did Aeneas, hard hit by her piteous fate, weep after her from afar as she went with tears of compassion. Then spoke the long-lived priestess of Phoebus, pointing ahead. Here is the spot where the way forks, going in two directions. The right hand leads beneath the battlements of Great Dis and is our route to Elysium. The left hand takes the wicked to Tartarus, their own place, and punishment eternal. Aeneas looked back on a sudden. He saw to his left a cliff overhanging a spread of battlements, a threefold wall about them, girdled too by a swift-running stream, a flaming torrent, hell's river of fire, whose current rolls clashing rocks along. In front, an enormous portal, the doorposts columns of adamant so strong that no mortal violence, nor even the gods of heaven, could broach it. An iron tower stands sheer and soaring above it, where Tisiphone sits, wrapped in a blood-stained robe, sleeplessly, day-long, night-long, guarding the entrance there. From within can be heard the sounds of groaning and brutal lashing, sounds of clanking iron, of chains being dragged along. O oh, famous lord of the Trojans, it is forbidden that any man pure in heart may cross the threshold of the damned. Come now, resume your journey, finish the task in hand, let us go quickly on. I can see the bastions forged in the Cyclops furnaces and the arch of the gateway yonder. They went on, into the fields of Elysium, the green and genial glades where the fortunate live, the home of the blessed spirits. What largesse of bright air, clothing the veils in dazzling light is here. This land has a sun and stars of its own. Deep in a green valley stood Father Anchises, surveying the spirits there confined before they went up to the light of the world above. He was musing seriously, and reviewing his folk's full tally, it happened, the line of his loved children, their destinies and fortunes, their characters and their deeds. Now, when he saw Aeneas coming in his direction over the grass, he stretched out both hands, all eagerness, and Aeneas too, his cheeks grew wet with a flood of tears. So you have come at last. The love that your father relied on has won through the hard journey. And now you are here with me. Three times he tried to put his arms round his father's neck. Three times the phantom slipped his vain embrace. It was like grasping a wisp of wind or the wings of a fleeting dream. Now did Aeneas descry, deep in a valley retiring, a wood, a secluded copse, whose branches soughed in the wind. Hereabouts were flitting a multitude without number, just as, amid the meadows on a fine summer day, the bees alight on flowers of every hue and brim the shining lilies, and all the fields are humming with them. Aeneas, moved by the sudden sight, asked in his ignorance who the crowd of people might be. Long... Long have I wanted to tell you of these and reveal them before your eyes, to count them over, the seed of my seed, that you might the more rejoice with me in the finding of Italy. These are the auguries, my son, whereby great Rome shall rule to the ends of the earth, shall aspire to the highest achievement, shall ring the seven hills with a wall to make one city. They are your Romans. Caesar is there, and all Ascanius posterity who shall pass beneath the arch of day. And here, here is the man, the promised one you know of, Caesar Augustus, son of a god, destined to rule where Saturn ruled of old in Latium, 
and there bring back the age of gold. His empire shall expand past Garamants and Indians to a land beyond the Zodiac. Let others fashion from bronze more lifelike breathing images, for so they shall, and evoke living faces from marble. Others excel as orators. Others track with their instruments the planets circling in heaven and predict when stars will appear. But Romans, never forget that government is your medium. Be this your art, to practice men in the habit of peace, generosity to the conquered, and firmness against aggressors. They marveled at Anchises' words. As far and wide, surveying all, they wandered through that region, those broad and hazy plains. After Anchises had shown his son over the whole place, and fired his heart with passion for the great things to come, he told the hero of wars he would have to fight one day, told of the Italians and the city of Latinus, and how to evade or endure each crisis upon his way. There are two gates of sleep. The one is made of horn, they say, and affords the outlet for genuine apparitions. The other's a gate of brightly shining ivory. This way, the shades send up to earth false dreams that impose upon us. Talking, then, of such matters, Anchises escorted his son and the Sibyl as far as the ivory gate and sent them through it. Aeneas made his way back to the ships and his friends with all speed, and then his fleet set sail north along the shoreline of Italy. The wind blew them steadily by night as well as day, a bright moon favouring the voyage, its radiance dancing upon the water. Then it happened that the wind dropped. All of a sudden, not one breath was blowing, and the oars toiled in water slow as syrup. Now, looking forth from the shallows, Aeneas sighted a big wood. Land ahoy! Yeah! Through this wood, the genial stream of Tiber flowing, yellow with racing eddies that stir up sand galore, debouches into the sea. Around and above, bright plumaged birds, whose habitat is the river banks and channel, charmed the air with their song, flitted about the wood. Stay to port. Aeneas ordered his squadron to change course towards the land. Soon, Take in high spirits, he entered the shady mouth of the river. Speak through me, then, spirit of song. Grim wars I've tell of, and battle fronts, and princes courageous unto death. The levies of the Etruscans, I, all of Italy, mustered in arms. A grander train of events is now before me, a grander theme I open. An old man, Latinus, was king of the towns and country, his reign being long and peaceful. Yet this king, by fate's decree, had no son. Lavinia, a daughter he had, sole prop of his house and heir to his throne. Many sought her hand in marriage from all Latium, all Italy. The handsomest by far of these wooers was Turnus, a prince of splendid pedigree and name, with the backing of the queen, who had set her heart on getting him as a son-in-law. But various alarming portents from heaven were proving an obstacle, for it happened while the maiden Lavinia stood beside her father, who with ritual taper was lighting the altar, sinister thing, they beheld her long hair set on fire, and all her headdress burning with crackling flames, they saw those queenly tresses ablaze, ablaze her coronet of precious stones. Before long, enshrouded in golden, glowering, smoky flames, she was fountaining sparks all over the palace. It was counted, of course, as a dreadful, miraculous manifestation. The maiden herself, they foretold, was singled out for a famous destiny. But for the people, it meant a widespread war. The king, greatly disturbed by this portent, goes to visit the oracle of Faunus, his prophet father, and seeks to question him, addressing the powers of the nether regions. He waits, and at once, from the depths of the wood, a voice came. 
Seek not, my son, to marry your daughter to a man of the Latin race. Embark not upon a native alliance. From abroad shall sons-in-law come to wed our women and make our name illustrious to their descendants. The whole spinning globe shall be a footstool and an empire. Soon, rumour had flown this omen far and wide throughout the towns of Italy, when the Trojan expedition lay with their vessels moored to the grassy bank of the Tiber. Aeneas, his lieutenants, and fair Ascanius sat themselves down beneath the boughs of a tall tree to have a meal. Now, it happened, Jupiter prompted the action, that they laid the food on flat cakes of meal about the grass. Well, when they had eaten all the rest, being still hungry, it befell that they turned their attention to the slender cakes of meal. With hands and teeth they were broaching ravenous those round cakes, when... The goodness, we're eating our tables too! Ascanius cried, joking. Just that. But it was enough, for his words proclaimed the beginning of the end of their trials. At once his father cried out, O oh, promised land of my destiny, here is our home, this is our country. I recall now my lost wife, Creusa, bequeathed me this secret of fate, saying, when you are come to a strange shore and compelled by hunger, food running short, to devour your tables, that is the time to look for a home in your weariness. That is the place, mark well, to choose a site and at last to found your promised city. Aeneas himself traced up the walls with a shallow trench and, breaking the ground, threw up a rampart and battlements as for a military encampment round his first home there on the coast. Then did Aeneas send out to the stately town of the king a hundred ambassadors chosen from every rank in his company. King Latinus learns of their approach. He orders them to be summoned to the great hall and awaits them there on the throne of his father's. First, he receives the greetings of the Trojans sent by Aeneas. Aeneas offers you too these gifts, small tokens of our old prosperity, relics we saved from burning Troy. Latinus received this Trojan speech with a gaze steadily fixed on the ground. He remained motionless, thinking hard, his eyes restive. It was not so much that the royal purple embroidered robe and the sceptre of Trojan Priam influenced the king, as that his mind was absorbed by thought of his daughter's marriage, and deeply pondering the oracle Faunus had given him. At last, much elated, he said, May the gods forward our project. Do you take back in reply this commission of mine to Aeneas? I have a daughter whom the gods will not permit to marry a man of her own people. Rather, they have foretold that Latium is destined a prince consort from overseas, promising that his blood shall exalt our name to the skies. I believe it's to Aeneas that fate points. Thus spoke the king, offering the Trojans friendship and peace. But look... On her way through the sky, Juno, the vindictive queen of heaven, sees at a distance Aeneas triumphant, his fleet all there. She notes they have disembarked from their ships and are busily building habitations already, feeling quite safe in that land. From heaven she descended, horrific, and hailed forth from the infernal regions, the home of the terrible deities, Alecto maker of grief, who revels in war, in open and underhand violence, in damaging quarrels. Now Juno began to speak, whetting this creature's appetite. Maiden, daughter of night, do me this favour, it's your kind. You can set brothers of one mind at one another's throats, torment a home with hatred, bringing your whips and destructive firebrands to lash the house. You have a thousand titles, a thousand tricks for making mischief. Stir up your teeming ideas. Disrupt the peace they have made. 
sow seeds of war. At once went Electo to the high walls of Latina's city, venom steeped. There she pickets our mater's quiet threshold. The queen, whose motherly heart is seething with grief and chagrin over the Trojans coming and the marriage with Turnus cancelled. On her, the fiend now casts a serpent, one of her snake-blue tresses, and thrusts it into her bosom, deep into her heart. Gliding between her dress and her smooth breasts, that serpent coils. She feels not its touch, nor notices it in her madness, breathing its morbid breath into her, swelling, it turns into a golden necklace, into the headdress binding her hair and its pendant ribbon, and slithers over her body. Then, overwrought by monstrous hallucinations, the poor queen went uncontrollably raving, beside herself round the city. Just so is it that a top goes spinning under the whiplash, and flew to the woods, hid her daughter among the forested hills, to cheat of his bride, the Trojan, or at least delay the marriage. When it was clear that the queen's first injection of madness was strong enough, and that the Latina's purpose and household were thoroughly shaken, the lowering Alecto mounted at once on her somber wings, and made for the walls of hot-headed Turnus. Here, in his high palace, Turnus was taking his rest at the mid-hour of night. Alecto now sloughed off her grim looks and diabolical form, changing herself to the likeness of an old crow. And as the aged priestess of Juno's temple, Calibe, coming before the young man's eyes, she spoke as follows. Turnus, will you tolerate that all your efforts should run to waste? The dominion you've worked for pass into the hands of foreigners. Up then, be strong of heart. Mobilize the army. March out of the gates to war. Those Trojan ships and leaders that occupy our beautiful river, burn them to ashes. So saying, she hurled an incendiary brand at Turnus, which buried itself deep in his heart, blazing and pitchily smoking. Extreme terror awoke him from sleep. A sweat broke out all over the young man's body, soaked him from head to foot. Madly yelling for arms by his bed, through his house he hunts for them. Crazy with bloodlust he is, with the criminal mania for fighting. Breaking the peace then, Turnus ordered his army commanders to get on a war footing and march to see King Latinus. Italy must be protected, the foe thrown back from its frontiers. These accursed foreigners, these Trojans, are called in to rule us. Our blood's to be mingled with theirs. I am debarred from the palace, from my own promised wife. He rouses the people. They mill through the streets, clamouring for war. A belligerent mob surrounds the palace of Latinus. He, like a sea cliff, stands, resistant, impregnable. Many appeals he made to the gods, to the deaf, blind heavens, but when he saw he had no power to quell their purblind demand, and all was going merciless Juno's way, the king shut himself in his palace, relinquished the reins of government. There was a custom of old in Latium, religiously kept up by the Alban townships, and now a tradition observed by Rome, mistress of empire, when first she prepares for battle. There are twin gates of war. A hundred bronze and bolts and bars of durable iron secure them. Janus keeps his perpetual watch by the entrance. When the Senate has made a final decision for war, the consul himself opens these gates on their grinding hinges, in person proclaims war. The soldiers take up his cry, and the bronze trumpets blare together in hoarse accord. After this manner, Latinus was now told to declare war on Aeneas' people, and open the joyless gates. But the good old king would not touch them. Turning away in revulsion from such a shocking duty, he buried himself from sight. Then did divine Juno glide down, 
and with her own hand, roughly push open those resisting doors, dash wide upon their turning hinges the iron gates of war. Indifferent and lethargic before, all Italy is at once a fire. Now the trumpet sound. The word goes out for war. One man hurriedly takes his helmet from store. Another yokes his neighing horses, slips on the shield the cuirass of triple-meshed gold chainmail, and straps his trusty sword on. Some ready themselves to march as infantry. Others are mounted on tall steeds and kick up a galloping dust. Not a young man is left who is not ready for war. The news of it was soon brought to God-fearing Aeneas late one night. Throughout the earth, deep slumber lay upon all weary creatures, lay on bird and beast alike. Bedded upon the river bank under the chilly vault of heaven, his heart much exercised by sombre thoughts about war, Aeneas at last yielded himself to sleep. Before his face there appeared now, rising amidst the leaves of the poplars out of that pleasant river, its deity, old Tiberinus. A veil of grey and gauzy stuff was draped about him. A coronal of weeds shadowed his brow. O oh, prince of divine lineage, do not give up or dread the threats of war. The swelling anger of heaven has abated. I prophesy certainties. Now pay heed while I tell you briefly how you may best unravel the urgent problem before you. Arcadians, the people of King Evander, have built a township on the hills. This people wages war persistently with the Rutulians. Make a treaty with them and get them onto your side. Thus the river god spoke, then sank out of sight, deep into his watery home. Aeneas awoke from night and dreaming, rose up, beheld the light of the orient sun in the sky, held out in solemn oblation his hands, which cut some water, then chose four ships, manned them, and issued the crew's weapons. All night and the following day, the Trojans rode without respite, up the long loops of the river, under the shade of diverse trees, through the green reflection of woods in the glass-calm water. The blazing sun had climbed to the midway of heaven when they saw in the distance walls, a citadel, and a few scattered roofs. The greatness of Rome has since exalted that place to the skies, but then Evander was lord of a meagre realm. Quickly, the Trojans steered to the bank and approached the settlement. It happened that day the Arcadian king was holding a festival in a grove outside the city, and with him his son, Pallas. Now, when they saw the tall ships come gliding up amid the trees, through the woods' dim vistas, and the oars quietly moving, alarmed by so unexpected a sight, they started up from the banquet as one man. But Pallas, undaunted, hurried towards the Trojans and hailed them from a vantage point at a distance. Who are you? Where do you come from? You bring peace or war? We are looking for King Evander. Tell him a deputation of Trojan leaders has come to plead for his alliance. Come ashore, whoever you are, sir. Come and talk to my father yourself. Do us the honour of being a guest in our house. He extended a welcoming hand and clasped Aeneas' right hand. Conversing together, they then approached the unpretentious feast grove of Evander. Cattle were everywhere, lowing, in what is now the Forum of Rome, mistress of the world. Most glad am I, bravest of Trojans, to welcome and get to know you. Be bold, great captain, for know you shall have my son here, my hope and consolation, Pallas, that under your tuition he may be trained in soldiering and watching your deeds model himself upon you. Him will I give two hundred Arcadian horsemen, the flower of our youth, 
and Pallas shall give you two hundred in his own name. All of a sudden, the heavens shook with a flash of lightning and thunder pealed. It seemed as if the whole universe suddenly tottered and Etruscan trumpets were bawling above them. Up there, among the fleecy clouds in the fair weather sky, were arms, red glinting and thunderously clashing through the clear air. The rest were stunned with amazement. But the Trojan hero heard in the sound his divine mother keeping a promise she'd given. Ah, what terrible slaughter awaits the Retullians now! What a price you will pay me, Turnus! How many shields and helmets and corpses of gallant men shall the Tiber roll beneath its waves? Now let them clamour for war and break their treaties! And soon, the gates have been opened and the horsemen have sallied forth. Aeneas with his close friend Arcates. Pallas too is riding in the middle of the column, his tunic and blazoned armour conspicuous. On the city wall stand the mothers, trembling. Their eyes follow those squadrons, flashes of bronze and a dust cloud rolling about them. Venus too, divinely shining among the dark clouds, descended, bringing gifts of war. A formidable helmet with plumes like fountains of fire, a sword that would deal out doom, a breastplate of hard bronze, and a shield made by Vulcan of miraculous workmanship. Upon this shield, the fire god, with knowledge of things to come, being versed in the prophets, had wrought events from Italian history and Roman triumphs. Upon it appeared the whole line that would spring from Ascanius' stock, and the wars they would fight in, one by one. He had depicted the mother wolf, as she lay full length in the green swarded cave of Mars, with the twin boy babies fondling and suckling at her others, fearlessly nuzzling their dam. Here too, a silvery goose went fluttering through a golden colonnade, honking out an alarm that the Gauls are on us. Centrally were displayed two fleets of bronze engaged in the Battle of Actium. The sea was a blaze of gold, on one side, Augustus Caesar, high up on the poop, is leading the Italians into battle, the Senate and the people with him. On the other side, with barbaric wealth and motley equipment, is Antony. Also, a shameful thing, Cleopatra, his Egyptian wife. The fleets are converging at full speed. The sea is all churned and foaming as the oarsmen take their long strokes and the trident bows drive on. In the midst, Cleopatra rallies her fleet with Egyptian timbrel, for she cannot yet see the two serpents of death behind her. Such were the scenes that Aeneas admired on the shield of Vulcan, elated by them. He shouldered his people's glorious future. But while Aeneas was thus engaged in a far distant part of the country, Turnus was calling his followers to battle. Soon his whole army was marching across the open plains, a mass of chargers, a mass of gold-embroidered apparel. Now did the Trojans see from behind their camp walls a dust cloud suddenly formed, a darkness mounting above the plain. The alarm was sounded. There were loud shouts as the Trojans came hurrying in through all the gates and lined the battlements. Aeneas that excellent soldier had instructed them so to do before he left. If such an emergency should arise in his absence, they must not risk deploying to fight in the open, only defend the camp from behind the rampart's protection. Turnus, who'd shot ahead of his cumbrously moving column, hurled a javelin into the blue, a prelude of battle. His companions acclaimed it with cheers and followed him with blood-curdling war cries. They were amazed at the Trojans' inactivity, amazed that such warriors did not come out on the open plain and there opposed them, but huddled in the camp. Impatiently, Turnus rode this way and that round the walls, seeking a way in where none was. Just as a wolf 
that lurks near to some crowded sheepfold, howling around the pens, in a fury of exasperation snarls at the prey he cannot reach, for long sharpening, grinding hunger has driven him wild and his throat is parched for blood. Just so did Turner's gaze at the camp's fortifications with mounting rage. His chagrin burned him right to the bone as he cast about for some way to get at the Trojans, dislodge them from their besieged emplacements and tumble them out in the open. Meanwhile, Aeneas and his army were ploughing the waters, cutting the river with their bronze prows, his men tugging hard at the sweeps and thrashing the currents. The Tiber's face foamed as they churned at it. And now, as he stood high up in the stern sheets, Aeneas held his Trojans and their encampment in view. So he lifted his shield with his left hand and made it flash. The Trojans upon the walls there raised a great shout. Their fighting spirit revived at this new hope. Their fire was redoubled. So it is when under the dark clouds the cranes, flying back to the northern rivers, announce their approach and trail their bugling cries as they swim through the air ahead of the south wind. But Turnus and the Italian commanders thought it a strange thing until, looking round, they saw ships backing up to the beach. The peak of Aeneas' helmet was blazing, flame poured from its lofty crest, and the golden boss of his shield spurted huge flashes. It was as when on some cloudless night you see a comet glowing, blood-red and ominous, a sinister light that carries with it drought and pestilence to suffering humanity. Yet the gallant Turnus' confidence was unimpaired. He reckoned to occupy the banks before them and beat off the landing forces. <laughs> Trumpets ring out. The battle rages on Italy's very doorstep. As in high heaven, the opposing winds battle with one another, equal in strength and spirit, wind to wind, cloud to cloud, wave to wave, locked and unyielding. Doubtful the issue, one long thrust and counter-thrust, neither side budging, just so did the ranks of Troy and Italy clash. Together, foot to foot, man to man, locked in the melee. But on the wing, Pallas saw his Arcadians turn tail and the enemy pursuing. The broken ground here had led them for once to dismount from their horses, but they were not accustomed to fighting on foot. So he tried the one thing left to him in such a grave situation and sought to revive their morale with a mixture of pleading and harsh rebuke. Where are you running to, men? I call on you by your brave deeds, by the name of your king Evander, by the wars we have won, by my own ambition which now is stirring to rival my father in glory! Ah! With these words... Pallas hurled himself into the thick of the foe. Just as, in summertime, when the winds he has prayed for have risen, a shepherd may light fires at intervals over the heathland, all of a sudden the interspaces catch fire, an unbroken line of crackling flame is spread across the broad acres. He sits and reviews the exultant flames like a conqueror. Even so did the brave hearts of Pallas men all rally and spurt. Meanwhile, Turnus cuts through the fray and moves out onto the field. The blood of the Arcadians grew chill and their hearts numb. Leaping down from his chariot, Turnus prepares for close combat on foot as a lion who has espied from some high point of vantage far off on the plain of bull spoiling for battle, he bounds forward. Yes, that was what Turnus on coming looked like. Pallas hurled his heavy spear, putting all his strength behind it, and plucked his sword, flashing out of the hollow scabbard. That skimming spear went home, high up, where shield and armour protect the shoulder, and actually piercing the rim of the shield, just managed to graze in the end the mighty body of Turnus. Turnus now gave himself plenty of time to poise and aim his spear. Pallas' shield, for all its layers of iron and bronze, was broken through in the centre 
by the impact of Turner's quivering spear point, which drove on to pierce the breastplate and then the breast. Pallas wrenched out the weapon, warm from the wound. It was no good. His blood and his life ebbed through the same channel at once. Hunched over the wound, he fell, his armour clanging above him. Fell with his bleeding mouth to the enemy soil, dying. Turnus straddled above him and spoke. What compensation there is in a tomb? What comfort in burial? He can have. He'll find he has paid dear enough for making friends with Aeneas. So saying, he pressed his left foot hard on the back of the corpse and tore off the sword belt, a thing of immense weight. For Turnus, a time is coming when he'd give anything to have left Pallas unharmed and will loathe this day and the spoils it brought him. The palace comrades clustered round him, laid his corpse on a shield and bore it away, lamenting and weeping. This calamity came to the ears of Aeneas now, not as a rumour, but from a messenger, sent to tell him his allies were right on the brink of disaster, were broken and needed succour immediately. Mowing down all who stood in his way, like a demon, he carved out a broad swathe with his sword through the foe. Mighty then were the deeds done all over the field by the Trojan leader, who stormed like a river in spate or a black cyclone. The ranks of the Italians now began to break. Officers, who had lost touch with their troops, wheeled away and raced back to Latium, King Latinus' city. But there was no holding the Trojans' deadly pressure, however hard you fought, no standing against them. The Latins, slinging their unstrung bows on weary shoulders, retired, and as they galloped away, the hammering hooves shook the plain. A dust cloud, dark and whirling, rolled up to the city walls, and the field of battle, blood-drenched, was left to the Trojans. But Aeneas wept, mourning Pallas. He bade the piteous corpse be lifted up, and choosing the noblest men from his whole army, detailed them to form the solemn cortege and to share in the tears of the bereaved Evander. Small consolation in such great grief, but one that was due to a sorrowing father. Now they are laying young Pallas aloft on a wickerwork bier, and he resembles a flower plucked by a girl's fingers, a gentle violet perhaps, or a fainting hyacinth, whose sheen and shape are not yet lost, not yet departed, though Mother Earth no longer can give it sap or strength. Aeneas now brought out two purple robes that were richly brocaded in golden thread. Sidonian Dido had made them with her own hands in the old days, interweaving the fabric with threads of gold and giving all her heart to the work. In one of these robes, he sadly wrapped Pallas, a farewell gesture, hooding with it the hair that would soon be burned to ashes. And still he wept. Brave Pallas, salute forevermore. Forevermore, farewell. Then did Venus put into the head of her son Aeneas that he should move on the city, divert his men to a sudden assault on its walls, and, surprising the enemy, disorganise and defeat them utterly. Scouring the various battle sectors for Turnus, he gives the order. His men are all seized by an equal enthusiasm, get into wedge formation, drive solidly at the walls. In a moment, ladders appear. In Senuris, the same instant, Aeneas, in the forward party, stretches his right hand up at the battlements, loudly rebukes Latinus, and calls the gods to witness that all the bloodshed has been forced on him. The citizens' nervous excitement bursts out into violent dissension. One party, demanding the gates be unbarred, 
the town thrown open to the Trojans, and Latinus himself hailed onto the walls. The others took arms and ran to the defence of their city. Meanwhile, at the far side of the plain, Turnus is fighting. Born on the wind, there came to him now an outcry, vague but frightening. He strained his ears. He had to listen. He heard the sound of a city in tumult, a murmur of no good cheer. And at once there came a Latin, racing up on his lathered horse, having ridden right through the enemy, though he was wounded by an arrow full in the face. He cried out to Turnus for aid. Aeneas attacks like a thunderbolt. Threatens to batter down the citadel of the Italians and blast us with total destruction. Already they're shooting up fire at our roofs. The Latins look to you, pray to you. You are our last hope. The picture of their changed fortunes struck Turner's dumb, bewildered him. Speechless and staring, he stood there, his heart in a violent conflict, torn by humiliation, by grief shot through with madness. As soon as the mists parted and he could think again clearly, he turned his blazing eyes upon the walls in great distress of mind, looked back at the city there from his chariot. He saw a whirling spire of flame which was leaping upwards, wave after wave, through the floors of a tallet had got a firm grip on it. Then at once he turned a speed to the city scattering the foe from his path, and to the walls where the earth was most deeply drenched with blood and the air screeched with missiles, he held up his hand as a signal, shouted for all to hear. Rotulli, put up your weapons! Cease fire, you Latins! Whatever the issue is, I shoulder it. Better that I redeem for you the breaking of the treaty and decide all in a duel. So then they drew apart, leaving a space in the midst for the combat. But Lord Aeneas, as soon as he heard the name of Turnus, hurried away from the walls, from the towers he was then attacking, broke off the whole engagement, impatient of any delay, overjoyed at the prospect of meeting Turnus and terribly clashed his sword on his shield. Now did the Rutuli, the Trojans, and all the Italians excitedly gaze at their two champions. All laid down their shields. Latinus himself marveled to see those giants, born in different parts of the world, now met together to fight it out in single combat. They, as soon as the lists were cleared on the open plain, exchanged spear shots from a distance, and then advanced at a run into the fight and met with a clang of their bronze and shield. Earth groaned beneath the encounter. The sword strokes rained so fast you could not see which hits were lucky and which were skillful. Then at once Turner sprang forward, thinking he saw a safe opening. Rose on tiptoe, whirled up his sword, and with all his strength behind it, struck. Trojans and the excited Rutulians cried out. Both sides were tense, keyed up, but the treacherous blade snapped. Yes, right in mid-stroke, it failed the fiery Turnus, so that then in desperation he tried this way and that to escape, out onto the open plain running in circles erratically. Aeneas pursued the while, though hampered and slowed down at times by an arrow wound he had received in his leg. Five times the pair ran in a circle, then, changing direction, returned on their own tracks. No light-hearted sporting event it was, though, the prize they ran for being the very lifeblood of Turnus. Meantime, the king of all-powerful Olympus addresses Juno as she looks down at the combat out of a golden cloud. My wife, how shall it end now? What more is there you can do? Then yield to my persuasions. Give up the long feud now at last. This is the end, I say. You had the power to harry the Trojans all over lands and seas, to kindle a cursed war, bring tragic disgrace on a king's home, and drape a betrothal in mourning. 
I forbid you to carry the feud any further. It is because your wishes, Great Consort, were known to me, that I have reluctantly given up Ternus and quit the Earth. One thing, and no ruling of fate forbids you to grant it, I do entreat. For Latium's sake, and the dignity of your own kin, do not command the native Latins to change their ancient name. Allow them to keep the old language and their traditional dress. Let the line be Roman. The qualities making it great be Italian. Troy's gone. May it be gone in name as well as reality. Come now, calm yourself. The Italians shall keep their native tongue and their old traditions. Their name shall not be altered. The Trojans will but sink down in the mass and be made one with them. All will be Latins, speaking one tongue. From this blend of Italian and Trojan blood shall arise a people surpassing all men, nay, even the gods in godliness. No other nation on earth will pay such reverence to Juno. The goddess bowed and agreed. Glad now to change her whole policy, passed forthwith from the sky, leaving her place in the clouds. Meanwhile, on the plain, Turnus, now doomed, looked and saw a mighty stone, a huge old stone, which for years had been lying there on the plain as a boundary mark between fields to prevent disputes about ownership. Hardly could twelve strong men of such physique as the earth produces nowadays pick up and carry it on their shoulders. Well, Turnus pounced on it, lifted it, and taking a run to give it more impetus, hurled this stone from his full height at Aeneas. But as he moved, as he ran, as he raised his hands, as he threw that boulder, for him it was just as if somebody else were doing it. Ice-bound were his veins, and his legs felt like water. So too the stone he hurled, flying through empty air, failed to make the distance, fell short of its objective. But, as it is in a nightmare, when sleep's narcotic hand is leaden upon our eyes, we seem to be desperately trying to run and run, but we cannot. We try but sink down nerveless, so now with Turnus. And then did his feelings veer this way and that in distraction. He gazed at the city, the Rotuli, faltered with fear, trembled at the weapon menacing him. So Turnus hesitated. Aeneas brandished his fateful spear and watched out for an opening, hurled it with all his might from a distance. The spear flew on its sinister mission of death like a black tornado, and piercing the edge of the sevenfold shield, laid open the corslet of Turnus, low down. Right through his thigh it ripped with a hideous sound. The impact brought giant Turnus down on bent knee to the earth. The Italians sprang to their feet, crying out. The hills all round bade back their howl of dismay. Far and wide, the deep woods echoed it. Turnus, brought low, stretched out a pleading hand, looked up at his foe in appeal. You have won. The Italians have seen me beaten. These hands outstretched. Lavinia is yours to wed. Don't carry hatred further. Aeneas stood over him, poised. And now what Turnus had said was taking effect, was making him more and more indecisive, when, on his enemy's shoulder, he noticed the fatal sword, the belt with its glittering studs, how well he knew it, which Turnus had stripped from young Pallas after he'd killed him and put on himself, a symbol of triumph and doom. 
Aeneas fastened his eyes on this relic, this sad reminder of all the pain Pallas' death had caused. Rage shook him. He looked frightening. Do you hope to get off now, wearing the spoils you took from my palace? It's he, it's Pallas who strikes this blow, the victim shedding his murderous blood in retribution. So saying, Aeneas angrily plunged his sword full into Turnus' breast. <laughs> the body went limp and cold. With a deep sigh, the unconsenting spirit fled to the shades below. <laughs>